Hey game makers, Pixelated Pope here, and in this two-part tutorial series, we're going to discuss three different types of parallax scrolling, and then show you how you can mix and match them as needed. Before we get to the demonstration of what we'll be making, let's talk about what parallax scrolling is. The term parallax scrolling, in the context of computer graphics, is where background images move by the camera slower than foreground images, creating an illusion of depth in a 2D scene and adding to the immersion. You can see the effect even in the real world, simply by looking out the side window of any moving vehicle. Signs and nearby trees will zip past your cone of vision, while mountains and clouds will move very slowly, almost unnoticeably. Even more extreme, the sun or the moon will not appear to move at all as long as you don't change direction. Humans instinctively use this information to intuit distance and scale, and reproducing this illusion in your game will have the same effect. It is actually pretty easy to accomplish in Game Maker, but creating art that can complement it, or fine-tuning the values that control it, can sometimes be a challenge. I'd like to show you what we'll be making pretty early on so you know whether the tutorial meets your needs before you spend 40 plus minutes going through the whole thing. Let's look at each of these demos and talk about what's happening. This first demo is the easiest form of parallax scrolling in GM. If you've ever attempted parallax in your past projects, this is probably similar to what you did. I've got a bunch of background layers that are tiled horizontally, and they all move at different speeds. Very easy to implement, but really only useful for endless runners or scrolling shooters where your character doesn't actually move, the level just scrolls towards them. This type of effect allows you to pan the camera in all directions. I call this interpolated parallax scrolling, as you need to use linear interpolation calculations to create the effect. This is most common in fighting games and sometimes platformers and top-down RPGs. This specific art was borrowed from Guilty Gear. This type of scrolling is awesome for space or underwater games where the play area is boundless. You use multiple levels of tileable backgrounds moving at different speeds relative to the camera's movement to reproduce this effect. You can even rotate and zoom the view when set up properly. Now this looks very similar to the first, with a few very important differences. The arches behind the player are using the infinite method since they are tileable, the mountains are set up in interpolated style, and the clouds are using a simple scrolling with a twist. I've further complicated things by allowing the view to be zoomed in. This makes the code quite a bit more complicated. One more quick note before we jump into this. I'm building this tutorial on top of my display manager we built in part 3 of the resolution and aspect ratio tutorial series. While all of these effects can be reproduced without the manager, I will be using the window zooming feature as well as pointing out some advantages that the display manager offers as we progress. Alright, now on to the first example. The majority of the work for simple scrolling is done in the room itself. In fact, you could do the entire thing in the room editor if it wasn't for the fact that when defining background speeds in the room editor, you have to use whole numbers for some stupid reason. So create a new room, then set the size to be appropriate for your art. In my case, a height of 368, and the width doesn't really matter since all the art is going to be tiled horizontally, but I'll set it to 1000. Set the room speed to 60 as well. Now let's go to the background tab to set up our background layers. I have 6 layers, but this method can be applied from 2 layers up to 8. If you didn't know, backgrounds are ordered from furthest to closest, 0 being the furthest and 7 being the closest, overlapping everything behind it. My background zero, the furthest back, is my mountain background, and as I'll do with all of these backgrounds, I uncheck tile vertically. Layer 1 is actually my moon, and the reason the moon appears on top of the mountains instead of behind as you might expect is because the moon isn't just the moon, but also the moon's reflection on the water below the mountains. And the mountains are not just the mountains, but also the sky behind the mountains and the moon, so it needs to be on the layer below the moon. Since there is only one moon, we obviously want to remove both horizontal and vertical tiling, and then we need to set its Y position so that the reflection appears on the water properly, 40 in this case. The next few layers, we're going to do all the same things. Set the background, remove vertical tiling, and adjust the Y off to position it properly. So I'll just do that all real quick. Now that our backgrounds are set up, we just need to create an object that sets the scrolling speed of each layer. Create a new object and give it a name like Object Background Scroller. 
This object is going to be very simple. Just add a create event and drop a code block in there. In here, we're going to go through each background and set a horizontal speed. The further back we want the layer to appear, the slower it should move. So our moon, which is on layer 1, should be set to a speed of 0. The rest of the layers, starting with 0, skipping 1, and going through 6, should all be set with gradually increasing speed. We want the scrolling to be from right to left, so all of these values will be negative. Just switch to positive values to scroll the other direction. 0 0.01 for the mountains, 0 0.05 for the clouds, 0.1 for the furthest layer of arches, 0.2 for the middle layer of arches, 0.3 for the closest arches, and 0.4 for the floor. One last change. We want our moon to appear in the center of the screen. I'm not using views yet, so just set the background's X position to half the room width. Drop an instance of the object in your room, making sure that the room is at the top of your rooms list, and run the game to see it in action. Experiment with the values we set in the create event yourself to see how they change the effect. Setting the mountains to a high speed and everything else a bit faster than that makes it look like your camera is moving very fast, while keeping it slow, but increasing the speed of layers 3 through 6 can make the mountains appear even bigger and further away. Try making the foreground move faster than the background so you can see how the illusion breaks down if the rules aren't followed. Finally, don't forget that these same principles can be applied to vertical scrolling for a similar effect, just moving up and down. Alright, on to more exciting applications of the parallax effect. Let's set up a room that uses interpolated parallax scrolling like you might find in a fighting game. To use this method, there are some requirements. First, your play area needs to be restricted. Like a level in a fighting game or even in Super Mario, you can't move left or right forever. Eventually, you'll reach the edge, and we rely on those boundaries for this to work. Secondly, you need to be using views, because we will be adjusting the position of our background layers relative to the movement of the camera in our game world to complete the illusion. In fact, all examples from now on will be assuming you are using views in your game. You can set your views up however you want, and move them however you want. As mentioned earlier, I'll be using the Display Manager built in my other tutorial for setting up my views. Finally, the art you are using for your background has two further requirements. One, the image for your closest background layer should be the size of your room. And two, the layers should get progressively smaller as they go further back. If that sounds complicated, well, it is. And it's about to get a lot more complicated, so buckle up. Before we get into the actual code, we need to talk conceptually about what we're going to be doing, because this can get a little mind-bending. If you are already comfortable with the LERP function, feel free to click the skip button or jump to the timestamp displayed on the screen, as this explanation will likely be quite lengthy. What is LERP? LERP is a built-in function in GameMaker, and it stands for Linear Interpolation. But what does that mean? Well, it's actually really cool. LERP takes three arguments, two values, and then a percentage between them, represented by 0 to 1. LERP returns a value relative to the two values based on the percentage you passed linearly. Linear is the key word there. As such, it's easy to visualize with a line. To define this line, we need the two values, our first two arguments. For this example, let's pick 0 and 10. Now, let's play with some different values for the third argument and see what we get. What about 0.5, 50%? That would give us 5, the value exactly halfway between 0 and 10. What about 0.75? That would give us 7.5. Hopefully you're already starting to see a pattern. But what if we passed 125%, 1.25? That would give us 12.5. LERP is not automatically clamped to the values you pass as the first two arguments which allows you to do some pretty awesome things, although we won't be taking advantage of that for this tutorial. So what does this have to do with parallax scrolling? If you have a moving camera, you have a few options to choose from when it comes to moving your background to try and create an interesting effect. The background could stay static in the room, and the camera could just sort of pan around it. This is okay, but it doesn't actually create an effect. The background could follow the view perfectly, and while this looks okay, and it does create an effect, it's not quite what we are looking for. So the best solution, which you've already seen, is somewhere in between these two options. 
We move the background relative to the position of the view, neither keeping it in place in the room, nor moving the background perfectly with it. We're going to use lerp to accomplish that. The first two arguments will be the minimum and maximum position for the background in the room, while the percentage we pass will be the position of the view between its own min and max positions. To keep things simple, let's just worry about our x values, as the same concept will be applied to the y value later. Let's look at the first set of values we are concerned about, the range of positions our view can be in. Remember that when we are positioning the view, we are always talking about the top left corner. When the view is all the way to the left, view x view equals zero. Easy enough. But what about when it's in the top right corner? How would we calculate that? Pretty simply, actually. We take the width of our room and subtract the width of our view. That gives us the two extreme values our view can be at, zero and room width minus view w view. Okay, now what about the background? Same thing, we're always concerned with the point in the top left corner. So when the background is all the way to the left, its x value is zero. And when it's all the way to the right, its x value is room width minus the width of the background. Now we plug these values into lerp, along with the current position of the view, using the background extremes as our first two arguments and the view's position over its max position to get a percentage. Background x, zero, equals lerp. What are the two values we want the background's x to be between? Zero and room width minus background width. Now our view values. View x view divided by, in parentheses, room width minus view w view. If view x view is zero all the way to the left, zero divided by anything equals zero. And if the view is all the way to the right, then view x view is equal to room width minus view w view. Room width minus view w view divided by room width minus view w view is one, since any number divided by itself is always one. This calculation will always return a value between zero and one for any position the view can possibly be in. Now, we can do the exact same thing for the y values, just using the appropriate y and height variables in place of x and width. Background y0 equals lerp 0, room height minus background height 0, view y view divided by, in parentheses, room height minus view h view. Now as we move our view, the background also moves to the appropriate position, and when the player is looking at this through the view, it will create a very convincing illusion of depth. Don't feel too bad if that seemed a bit overwhelming. Like I said earlier, it's a very involved process, but you'll get the hang of it as you find more uses for Lerp. All right, back to our example project. Let's create a new room, and just like we did before, set up our layers. My room has three layers. In this style of parallax, your frontmost layer doesn't move at all. This would typically be all the tiles that your character can run around on and wall objects that block their path. Since this is a stage in a fighting game, I'm just using a static image. As it's my frontmost layer, I'll use its size to define my room size, 1536 by 1024. Head to the Backgrounds tab to set up our layers. I set Background 2 to be my front layer image, and disable any tiling. Background 1 is my middle image of the train, again no tiling, and Background 0 is my sky, no tiling. If you aren't using the Display Manager, set up your view. I recommend a width of 456 and a height of 256 if you are following along using the art from the example project file. There is a view size that is too big where the illusion will break, and that can often be a challenge with using this style of parallax. If it doesn't quite look right when you finally run the game, try resizing your view or modifying your art to compensate. Alright, let's create an object to manage all of this madness. Give it a name like Object Bound Controller. We don't really need a create event unless you want to center your view at the start or something, so just add a step event. First, we need some simple controls to move the view around and lock it to the room. I'm not going to go too in depth on how to do this as I expect this is something you've done before, but you can pause the video and examine the code if you need to. Now, drop another block of code in underneath that. This is where the real work is done. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be positioning every background relative to where the view is in the room. To do this, we are going to be utilizing lerp, just like we talked about a minute ago. 
Since we'll be using Lerp the same way for both scrolling background layers, we want to get the X and Y position of the view and convert it to a percentage value for use as the third argument in our Lerp calls. So add two vars and name them X posts and Y posts. X posts is equal to view X view divided by, in parentheses, room width minus view W view. Y post is equal to view Y view divided by, in parentheses, room height minus view H view. Now let's move the background between the two possible extreme positions using Lerp just like we did a minute ago. If that's confusing, and you skipped the explanation earlier, maybe you should go back and watch it. For the rest of you, let's position the next layer. The code to position the train layer is exactly like the sky, only using the correct background index for this layer. Let's run the game and see what that looks like. That's not too bad, but it doesn't quite look right, does it? Because the middle layer is scrolling so slowly compared to the foreground, it creates the illusion that the train and building back there are absolutely titanic and miles away like mountains rather than just on the other side of the wall. So how do we fix this? Right now, the allowed extremes for our middle layer are what is creating the slower scrolling. What we need to do is reduce the distance it can travel so that it travels faster as the view moves. To do this, we'll just add some margins to the edge of our extremes so that they don't go all the way to the edge of the room. This will prevent the background image from ever being at the edge of the screen, but the resulting effect will be much more convincing. So add a couple of vars, var h margin and var v margin. We're going to have different vertical and horizontal margins to give us a bit more control over these adjustments. This can be one of the more tedious aspects of this form of parallax is finding the perfect margins that don't accidentally show the edges of your art, but also suggest the proper scale and distance can be a lot of trial and error. Once we've settled on the values, we need to update our lerp calls to incorporate them. Background x1 equals lerp h margin, room width minus background width 1 minus h margin, x position. And background y1 equals lerp v margin, room height minus background height 1 minus v margin y position. Nothing about the third argument has changed, as we aren't restricting the view at all. However, we are restricting the two extreme possible locations for our background image. Instead of going from 0 to room width minus background width, we can only go from margin to room width minus background width minus margin. The margin values I'm going with are 200 for the horizontal margin and 50 for the vertical margin a horizontal restriction of 400 pixels, and a vertical restriction of 100 pixels. Let's see if that looks any better. Not bad. The train in the background is maybe a bit too big visually, and I could scale down the background and increase the margins even more, or maybe even change the art itself. There are lots of options to fine tune the effect. Try playing with it and see what you get. Don't be afraid to plug in some crazy numbers just to see what happens. Thanks for sticking with me through this. I know things got a little heavy there, but hopefully your game will be more visually interesting by utilizing these effects. In the next part, we're going to cover infinite scrolling with an infinite space example, and finally, how everything can be combined into a single scene, including support for zooming in and out. If you'd like to see more tutorials like this, hit those like and subscribe buttons, and if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for other tutorials, use the space provided below the video. While you wait for the next part of parallax scrolling, why not check out my tutorial on resolution and aspect ratio management if you haven't already? Or maybe try the pilot episode of Pixelated Pope Private Investigator, where I take bugs that you, the viewers, are hung up on in your project and show you how I would debug them. Thanks for watching, now go make something awesome.